Hi, this is History with Andrew Allen, and today is episode 14 of my series on the Mexican Revolution, the Headless Rebellion, and the End of Obregón. Before I forget, I include the names of the people I talk about and my sources in the description. As I explained last episode, Alvaro Obregón's revolt against Venustiano Carranza had succeeded, and interim president Adolfo de la Huerta had negotiated peace with all of the rebel groups. Even Pancho Villa and the Zapatistas had surrendered, leaving Mexico at peace for the first time since the initial revolt against Porfirio Diaz. Although Obregón easily won election as president, he clearly did not accept democratic opposition since the leader of a powerful political party barely survived an assassination attempt that sparked a revolt by part of the army. The revolt was quickly crushed, but a more serious issue was Woodrow Wilson's refusal to recognize the new Mexican government, which mattered since Obregón needed American loans to rebuild Mexico. Worse, Warren Harding won election as president, and his cabinet had close ties to the oil industry, which lobbied the president to pressure Mexico to not enforce the 1917 constitution. The situation looked bad until oil man Edward Doheny was accused of bribing the Secretary of the Interior for a favorable drilling deal, and then Harding died suddenly. Following the Teapot Dome scandal and the resignation of Secretary of the Interior Fall, for corruption, the oil lobby, especially Doheny, lost influence, so Secretary of State Charles Evans Hughes began to listen to the Mexican perspective while the European powers were tired of not recognizing Mexico. Actually, the governors of border states were already starting to improve relations with Mexico on their own. Even William Randolph Hearst's powerful chain of newspapers pointed out that Obregón deserved recognition since he protected American interests. Hearst's favorable coverage was probably in exchange for permission to keep his ranches in northern Mexico. The time was ideal for negotiations to resolve the issue of losses by American companies during the revolution. Arriving in Mexico City in May 1923, the American negotiators were given a lavish welcome and the negotiations started well since the Mexican government had just made the first interest payment on the debts. The negotiations were already going well when President Harding died of a heart attack on August 2nd and was succeeded by Vice President Calvin Coolidge who signaled willingness to award diplomatic recognition. In the end, the oil fields had become less valuable while the American government had come to appreciate the stability offered by Obregón. After lengthy negotiations, Obregón held on to Article 27, thus preserving the principle of national ownership of subsoil rights, but he agreed that Mexico would not apply Article 27 retroactively, therefore most concessions awarded by Porfirio Diaz and Victoriano Huerta would continue. Signed on August 13th, the treaty was called the Bucareli Treaty because the negotiations took place in a government building on Bucareli Street. It was probably the only solution, but Minister of Finance Adolfo de la Huerta was understandably angry that Obregón had publicly criticized him a year earlier and then sacrificed Mexico's national serenity. Actually, the treaty was never officially ratified because it was never formally approved by the Congresses of both countries. Still, the agreement did result in diplomatic recognition. However, the oil company's dislike of Obregón did not disappear, and they began to divest their operations in Mexico. After serving as president for four years, Obregón was willing to follow the Constitution and limit himself to a single term, but he wanted Minister of the Interior Plutarco Calles to be his successor. As a courtesy, Obregón asked Pancho Villa to announce publicly that he would not enter the election. Speaking of Villa, how had he adjusted to peace after a decade of war? Immediately after laying down his weapons, Villa had announced four goals. Keep the peace with Obregón, transform the hacienda into a successful military colony, bring order to his personal life, and stay alive. The numerous children from his collection of mistresses and wives were gathered at the hacienda, but only two wives and the headmistress were allowed in the hacienda, and only as long as they did not squabble when he was present. Although Obregón had promised to leave Villa alone, 
Via had many enemies, permitted only 50 official bodyguards. Via's security depended on the numerous former Villistas who had settled on either his hacienda or nearby estates, while the hacienda was turned into a fortress. As Via aged, it became clear that he was interested only in caring for the needs of the men who were personally loyal to him and had no interest in land reform for anyone else. Still, he could easily accomplish his goal and stay alive. All he had to do was stay out of politics, which proved difficult. Grown bold after four years of peace, Villa announced that he might run for governor of Durango and openly supported Minister of Finance de la Huerta, who was backed by conservatives, including much of the army, for president. Worse, he boasted that he could raise 40,000 men in 40 minutes. This was not simple grandstanding since Villa genuinely disliked Caius, viewing him as a Bolshevik due to his radical politics and support of labor unions and peasant organizations. Terrified by this rash behavior, De La Huerta urged Villa to support Caius. A uh, defiant Villa simply switched his support to Raul Madero. Villa's opposition would not have been a major problem if Caez was not extremely unpopular and trailed far behind De La Huerta and Madero. Although he was buying weapons, lots of weapons, and had defied a man who had a deep personal reason to want him dead, Villa ignored rumors of a plot to assassinate him. Leaving the security of his hacienda, a cost-conscious Villa traveled to be a godfather at a christening at a nearby village with only two guards. A guerrilla who had avoided countless traps and ambushes was finally killed while sitting in a car on July 20th, 1923. There was little doubt that Villa had been assassinated by someone high in the government since the entire garrison of the town had been sent out on patrol and the telegraph line had been cut. The assassination had been arranged by Militon Lozoya, the administration of Villa's hacienda before he took position. Angry that Lozoya had embezzled large amounts of money, Villa had prevented Lozoya's uncle from becoming governor of Durango. So, Lozoya had resolved to kill Villa. Chihuahua Governor Castro, another enemy of Villa, had ensured the cooperation of the garrison commander, Jesus Salas Barraza voluntarily confessed to organizing the plot, even though he had never dealt with Villa before. Given a sentence of 20 years, Barraza was released several months later, and given the rank of colonel in the Mexican army, which unsurprisingly led to rumors that Barraza had simply taken the blame to spare the government. Obregón's degree of involvement is still debatable, but he was not unhappy to see Villa dead, and he made little effort to launch a serious investigation into the assassination. In addition, it seems unlikely that Governor Castro would have proceeded without first obtaining Obregón's permission, since the Mexican government was about to sign a treaty with the United States that granted oil companies favorable treatment in exchange for American recognition. The chances of Villa and de la Huerta leading a nationalist revolt were quite large. Rumors later circulated in Mexico that Villa's death had been the price of the treaty. Speaking of de la Huerta, he had grown disenchanted with Obregón, recognizing that the hero of the revolution had become a strongman ruler. Callas was backed by the governors of Veracruz and Tabasco, and Obregón had presumed that the other generals would accept Callas as president. He was wrong. Several generals, including Enrique Estrada, Fortunato Maicote, and Guadalupe Sanchez, wanted an open election process. Moreover, two former members of the Sonora faction ex-Yucatan Governor Salvador Alvarado and ex Alisco Governor Manuel Dieguez wanted De La Huerta. So De La Huerta's revolt on December 7th, 1923 should not have been a surprise. Obregón was acting like a dictator, arranging the assassination of rivals and attempting to impose his successor, just like Carranza. When De La Huerta formally revolted, he was supported by General Estrada in Guadalajara, Manuel Diegas in Salvador Alvarado, and General Fortunato Macote in Oaxaca. Although the revolt was impressive, it was badly led. De La Huerta could not lead it since he lacked military experience. As a result, the revolt was called the Headless Rebellion. 
Although De La Huerta had considerable support in Congress and the PNC and railroad unions, he did not have many potential military allies since Pancho Villa had already been assassinated and Manuel Pelez was arrested when he re-entered Mexico. Outnumbered, Obregón reminded the agricultural rebels that they had received their lands through him and would likely lose those lands if the La Huerta won. Most of the agricultural rebels agreed and fought for Obregón. Saturnino Cedillo would prove to be a key leader. Finally, Obregón defeated Estrada at Ocalatán, Jalisco in a hard-fought but decisive victory in the spring of 1924. Having beaten the revolt, Obregón rejected unity and had both Diegues and Alvarado shot. In fact, scores of officers were executed. The La Huerta went into exile in the U.S. Calles then easily beat his only opponent, Sinaloan General Ángel Flores, becoming president on November 30th, 1924. After Calles became president, Obregón returned to Sonora and threw himself into his thriving ranch. However, the lure of national politics was irresistible, and he began making visits to the capital, officially for health reasons, but mainly to maintain his considerable influence. As a result, many people wondered if Obregón had followed Porfirio Diaz's example and installed a loyal placeholder until he was ready to return to the presidential office. Calles probably wondered the same, since the legislature was controlled by Obregón's followers, not Calles' followers. When the railway link between Sonora and Mexico City was finally complete, Obregón's visits became more frequent. Determined to be his own man, Calles gained the support of several leaders in the southeast, especially Governors Je Toma Garrido Canabal of Tabasco and Carlos Vidal of Chiapas, both fervently anti-clerical. In addition, he maintained his close alliance with the powerful Union Crom at the cost of support from the agrarian PNA. Still, the Bank of Mexico was formed under Calles, and he launched a road-building project. Calles was doing well until he picked a fight with the Catholic Church, believing that the church plotted to overthrow him. In May 1926, he banned priests from teaching, and the clergy responded by suspending services. Obregón felt that the conflict with the church threatened the fragile stability of the nation, and he was proven right when the Cristeros War erupted on January 1, 1927. Several hundred thousand people would die before the government made sufficient concessions to the church, which ended the fighting in 1929. I know, that is an extremely brief summary. But the war is not really part of the Mexican Revolution, and a proper explanation would require at least another episode. Despite the warfare raging throughout much of the country, the struggle for the presidential chair remained dominant. As Calles term neared its end, it was clear that Obregón wanted to be president. Again, but an attempt to amend the Constitution to permit a second non-consecutive term had failed in 1925. Also, his protégé General Francisco Serrano had his own ambitions. Former candidate General Ángel Flores had been preparing his own campaign until he died from poison in 1926. Obregón's two main opponents were both generals, Serrano and Gómez, dividing the opposition. Even so, Calles had decided to back Obregón and took his mission seriously, ordering the arrest of Serrano and Gómez on October 3rd. Arrest is not exactly the right word. Serrano and 12 of his men were executed. Gómez was caught and executed a month later. Actually, the number of executed men was in the hundreds, so public sentiment turned against Obregón as people realized his dark side. Regardless, Obregón had managed to become president again. Whether he planned to imitate Porfirio Diaz and rule as a dictator with the illusion of elections is unknown, since he died less than two weeks after his election. Obregón had survived a number of assassination attempts, but his luck ran out on July 17, 1928, when he was killed by a young Catholic at a political luncheon. The capital was filled with theory, some blaming the Cristeros, some blaming the government. There was no obvious succession since the office of vice president had been abolished in 1917. If Calles had taken the easy route of remaining in office, it would have sparked more revolts. After considering the matter for six weeks, he announced during his last address to Congress that he would never serve as president again. 
Instead, he created the National Revolutionary Party that would rule the nation as an institution rather than under the authority of a single man since each president could only serve a single six-year term. As I conclude the series, I will take a moment to review the revolution since I covered a lot of material. Porfirio Diaz had ruled Mexico for nearly 40 years, but he was an old man unwilling to surrender his grip on power. So he exiled Bernardo Reyes, the best candidate for a stable succession. Instead, the much younger Francisco Madero challenged him directly and should have been squashed like an insect, but his revolt sparked a massive wave of uprisings and Diaz fled into exile. Unable to balance the conflicting demands of the rebels and the establishment, Madero faced a series of revolts and was finally overthrown in a coup by General Victoriano Huerta. A more brutal version of Diaz, Huerta had Madero murdered but found himself facing numerous revolts led by Pancho Villa, Venustiano Carranza, and Emiliano Zapata, and eventually fled into exile, although he outlasted Madero's time in the presidential chair. People were ready for peace, so the various rebel leaders organized a convention to settle who would be president. This should have been a simple matter, since even long-term rebel Emiliano Zapata attended the convention. Unfortunately, Carranza wanted to be president and refused to recognize the candidate chosen by the convention. This should have resulted in his swift defeat and execution, since Villa and Zapata led the two largest armies in Mexico, but they proved to be uneasy allies, and Carranza was supported by Alvaro Obregón, a much, much better general than Villa. There were other revolts, notably Zapata's revolt, but Carranza soon became comfortable in the presidential chair. Admittedly, he had to deal with unexpected problems like an American invasion following Villa's raid in New Mexico and the surprisingly successful revolt by Felix Diaz in Veracruz, but Diaz was contained, the Americans were soon drawn into World War I, and Zapata was finally killed. Carranza was poised to become the first president to hand over power, but he tried to prevent Obregón from succeeding him. The situation quickly escalated, and Carranza died while trying to flee into exile. This time, everyone was ready for peace. Even Pancho Villa, who was grudgingly granted amnesty by Obregón, so the revolution was finally over. Well, until Obregón arranged the assassination of his rivals and tried to ensure the election of his preferred successor, Plutarco Calles, denied a fair election, his opponents revolted but were crushed, and Callas was elected. Apparently missing the presidential chair, Obregón ran again for president when Callas' term ended, but was assassinated weeks after winning the election. Following the death of the last major leader of the revolution, Callas embraced a different approach and created a party that would rule Mexico as an institution. That decision began a new era in Mexico and serves as a proper end to the series. Thanks for listening.